What if your country's smartest person was sent away, and in the end, he built something powerful for someone else? His name was Qian Shu Essen. He was once a rising star in America, a brilliant scientist, one of the founders of Jet Propulsion Laboratory, trusted by the U.S. military, a friend to the world's top engineers. But everything changed during the Red Scare. Because he came from China, Qian was accused of being a communist. There was no real proof, no trial. He was locked up, questioned, then finally deported. America thought they removed a threat, but what they really did was send away the future of China. Back in his homeland, Qian didn't give up. With just a chalkboard and a strong will, he started China's rocket program from nothing. And today, because of him, China has become a space power. Sometimes, one mistake can change the balance of the whole world. A small boy sat quietly on the rooftop of his house. The wind from Hangzhou touched his hair. He looked at the pale sky, not because it was beautiful, but because he was waiting, waiting for that sound. In the distance, a low rumble began, the sound of foreign military planes flying overhead. Adults panicked. Children ran indoors. Qian Shuesen was afraid too. He hid under the table, hands over his ears. But slowly, that fear became something else. He started listening more carefully. He memorized the rhythm of the engines. He wondered, what kind of machine can fly like that? How does it work? No one knew. This fear was the first spark of a dream. Qian was born in a broken country. It was 1911. The Qing dynasty had just fallen. China was full of war, foreign soldiers, and no peace. But inside his small home, one thing still mattered, education. His father was a reformer. He believed that if China wanted a future, it needed science. He gave Qian books, Newton, Galileo, even scientific writings from Russia. While other children listened to bedtime stories, Qian listened to lessons about gravity and machines. Books can give you strength, his father said one night. But science can save a nation. To Qian, those words became a promise. In school, Qian was quiet. He wasn't easy to talk to, not because he was proud, but because his thoughts were always somewhere else. He walked slowly, spoke softly, and preferred the back of the classroom, where he could take notes in peace. While other students played, Qian sat in the library or near the window, watching the sky again. To the few friends he had, Qian was a good listener. He didn't speak often, but when he did, everyone paid attention. One day, when he was 13, his math teacher, a strict man who almost never gave compliments, wrote a very difficult calculus problem on the board. It wasn't homework. It was a punishment. But after class ended, only one student stayed in the room. Qian. He stared at the board. His hand moved slowly across the paper. Two hours later, the problem was solved. The teacher walked back in and saw it. He looked at Qian for a long moment. If you continue like this, he said, you won't just help China. You'll scare powerful nations. Qian said nothing. He only nodded and kept writing. Years passed. Qian was accepted into Jiaodong University in Shanghai, one of the best schools in China. There, his love for flight became stronger. He studied rockets, missiles, and flying machines. He read the works of a Russian scientist named Tsiolkovsky, who once said, the earth is the cradle of mankind, but mankind cannot stay in the cradle forever. Qian wrote an essay about the future of flight and national defense. It didn't just show technical knowledge, it showed vision. He won a university competition. His professors were amazed by the way he connected science and national progress. Soon after, he received a scholarship to study abroad. First at MIT, then at the California Institute of Technology, Caltech. It was his first time leaving China. The morning he left, the docks of Hangzhou were cold and foggy. His mother held his hand tightly. Don't forget our sky, she whispered. One day, come back with knowledge. Chin didn't speak. He just nodded. Then he climbed aboard the ship. Standing on the deck, he wrote in his notebook, I don't only want to understand the sky. I want to build it. He didn't know then, the land that welcomed him warmly, would one day push him away 
cold and silent. In 1935, Chien Shuesen stepped onto American soil for the first time. He arrived at the port of San Francisco, carrying a small suitcase and big dreams. Around him, tall buildings touched the sky. Cars moved fast on wide roads. The city lights glowed even before the sun had fully set. He stood still, not because he was lost, but because he was amazed. This was the world he had only read about in books, a place where science and dreams could grow together. And in his first few years in America, Chien believed that dream was real. He was accepted into Caltech, one of the best engineering schools in the world. There, he met Theodore von Karman, a world-famous scientist in aerodynamics. But Karman didn't see Chien as just a student. He saw him as a partner, a future leader in science. In the late 1930s, Chien and Karman helped create the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, a small lab in Arroyo Seco that would one day become the heart of America's space program. Together, they tested small rockets, built engines, and dreamed about the sky. Chien's name quickly rose. People began calling him a brain among brains. He wasn't just a smart foreign student, he became part of America's dream. When World War II started, America needed its best scientists. Chien was asked to join the Pentagon as a consultant. He was even given the rank of Colonel, an incredible honor for someone who wasn't citizen. His mission, to help stop a terrifying weapon from Germany, the V-2 rocket, the world's first ballistic missile. At JPL, the team worked day and night. Chien helped design systems that could defend cities from deadly attacks. He was still in his 30s. But his mentor, Carmon, said, You are not just a scientist, Chien. You are an architect of the sky. After the war, Chien was sent to Germany. He studied the remains of the Nazi rocket program and collected secret documents. Most importantly, he interviewed Werner von Braun, the man who built the V-2. Two rocket mines, one from the east, one from the west. Chien studied everything, fuel systems, launch mechanics, flight control. This wasn't just about war. This was about the future of space. In 1949, Chien decided he wanted to stay in America for good. He applied to become a U.S. citizen. That was the moment. Everything changed. His name was found on an old list from the American Communist Party. No proof of activity, maybe just a name and a meeting record. But America was deep in the Red Scare, a time when fear of communism controlled everything. Just two weeks after that discovery, his entire career ended. His lab access was removed. His honorary military rank was taken back. His passport was frozen. His job was gone. And his friends slowly disappeared. Chien was no longer seen as a scientist. He was seen as a threat. For the next five years, he lived like a prisoner. In his home in Pasadena, he stayed quiet, reading old books, writing in his notebook, and staring at the sky. The same sky that once gave him hope. Now only reminded him of what he had lost. His phone was tapped. His letters were opened. Every knock on the door made his heart race. Not from curiosity, but from fear. Chin had never joined any party. He loved science, not politics. But the country that once welcomed him with open arms now had no room for him at all. In the end, America made its decision. They would deport him. They thought they were removing a problem. But what they really did was hand over their greatest mind to their future rival. In 1955, after five years of being locked in his own home, treated like a threat and accused without proof, Chen Shuesen was finally allowed to return to China. For the United States, it was just the end of a case. But what they didn't know was that they had just handed over the future to their rival. At the port, ready to board the ship back to Asia, Chen looked calm. But inside, his heart was burning. I came to America to learn, not to be hurt, he told a reporter. Now I know where my life truly belongs. He left with no money, no job, but he still had something no one could take away, knowledge. When Chin arrived in Beijing, he was not welcomed as a hero. China was still in the middle of a revolution. The government did not trust people who had lived in the West, especially scientists. Chin was watched, questioned, and tested. He had to prove his loyalty. The truth was, Qian was not a communist. He had married Jiang Ying, the daughter of Jiang Bailey, 
a general and close advisor to Chiang Kai-shek, the leader of nationalist China, now in Taiwan. Politically, Qin's family connection was dangerous, but Qin never cared about politics. He only wanted one thing, to build. In the early 1960s, Qin was given a huge task to develop China's rocket technology for defense and space exploration. But when he started, he had nothing. No rockets, no advanced machines, not even trained engineers. Still, Qin didn't complain. He started from zero. He redrew the V-2 rocket design he had studied in Germany. Then he changed it to fit China's resources. That was the beginning of Dongfeng, meaning East Wind. The first rocket Dongfeng-1 had a range of about 600 kilometers, enough to reach key targets in East Asia. A simple engine using ethanol and oxidizer, inspired by the German V-2. The ability to carry a light nuclear warhead. A basic structure, but efficient and powerful. It was more than just a weapon. It was a symbol, a sign that China could stand on its own. But Qian didn't only build machines. He built people. He trained young engineers, teaching them discipline, logic, and love for their country. Many of them would later lead China's biggest space projects. One student once said, he never talked about politics, but the way he led, we knew he was building a nation. Then in 1970, everything changed. China launched its first satellite, Dong Fong Hong I, which means the East is red. The rocket used was Long March, developed from Dong Fong. China became the fifth country in the world to enter space. And at the center of it all was Qian Shuesen, the man they once locked up, the man they once called a threat, but who never stopped believing. The West had closed its doors out of fear, but from a small window in Beijing, Qian Shuesen looked much further into a future beyond the atmosphere. In 1970, the world suddenly went silent, not because of war, but because of song. The Chinese national anthem, Dong Fong Hong, was playing from space. Not from a radio on Earth, but from a small satellite orbiting our planet. It was Dong Fong Hong I, China's very first satellite. And with that launch, the world realized China was no longer just looking at the sky. They were starting to write their future among the stars. And the first hand to write that future was a hand once cast aside. Qin Shi Wesen never asked for fame. But history gave him the spotlight. The Long March rocket, which launched that satellite, was built on the foundation of the Dongfeng Project, a project Qian created after returning from America, with nothing but a chalkboard, a small room, and big hopes. Today, Long March is more than a rocket. It's a symbol, used for weather satellites, communication missions, China space station Tiangong, and even international launches. All of it stands on the silent work Qian began long ago. But Qian never lived for applause. He turned down high positions. He stayed away from the media. He preferred to sit in his study, teaching, reading, and writing. When asked about his past in America, he simply said, science does not belong to one country. It belongs to all of humanity. To Qian, the past wasn't something to cry over. It was something to build from. Behind his quiet life, there was a quiet love, too. His wife, Jiang Ying, was a famous opera singer and the daughter of Jiang Bailey, a top general under Chiang Kai-shek. Despite their very different backgrounds, they stayed together for more than 60 years. They had two children. One of them, Qian Yonggang, became a professor and later wrote about his father's life. He didn't build rockets, but he kept the memory alive. Behind every rocket that flies, there is a home that keeps its fire burning. Years passed. China built space stations, explored the moon, and prepared for Mars. And in every mission, Qian's ideas still lived in the systems, the designs, and the spirit. Qian passed away in 2009 at the age of 97. He never returned to America. But many scientists at Caltech and NASA later sent private letters of apology. Late but sincere, Qian didn't reply. Because he knew, time will speak for him. They push me away out of fear. Now they read my notes, because they want to learn. His legacy is not written on stone, but it flows. In every rocket that rises from China's soil, in every child who looks up and asks, how do we get there? He is proof that one man, once seen as a threat, 
can become the reason why a nation now stands proud. Among the stars. If this story touched you, or helped you see the world a little differently, please hit like and share with your friends. Maybe this story can inspire not just you, but someone out there who needs a little light. And if you know another person whose life deserves to be told, drop it in the comments. Because like Qian Shu Essen, those who fight in silence often carry the brightest light for the future. See you in the next great story. And thank you for listening.